from Music for All and presented by Yamaha. It's teaching social emotional learning through music, a practical web series for all music educators, embedding SEL into music education. On this episode, we welcome licensed therapist and music educator Gary Main. Please welcome our host of teaching social emotional learning through music, Scott Edgar. Hi, everybody. Scott Edgar here with our next episode of Teaching Social and Emotional Learning Through Music. You know, I, I, I draw such a line in the sand, and one of my go-to phrases is, we're not counselors. Well, I can't say that today because our guest is Gary Main, who is a counselor, and we are just so thrilled to learn from somebody who not only has that background as a mental health professional, but brings with it just so many different experiences in terms of being a music teacher, being a professional musician. And as we enter this fall, and we know that we're gonna be confronted by the mental health crisis, that teachers and students are confronting trauma, that we're going to need tools to move forward through in our music classroom. Folks like Gary are gonna be our best friends. So Gary, welcome to our show. Thank you so much for joining us. Hey, thank you very much, Scott. It's a pleasure to be here. And really looking forward to it. Absolutely, my friend. Thank you so much. Uh, can you tell us a little bit? You know, I, I we we're, we've become fast friends, and and we were connected by a mutual friend. But tell us a little bit about your journey, because I think it's a journey that many of us have had. And then yours decided to take a little bit of a left turn, but you kept many of those hats on the entire time. I appreciate that, and you know, I think this background is important. I'm going to get through it as efficiently as I can so we can get to the good stuff, okay? But it is important because it's it's how I how I connect with the topic. So, you know, I, I attended my first band concert at two weeks old. That was my dad's high school band when he was the band director at Dobson High School in Mesa, Arizona. And then my elementary school was Shashin Elementary School. Uh, shout out to Mr. Ron Anderson, my elementary school music teacher. Quickly moved on to middle school at Franklin Middle School, where I picked up the trombone in sixth grade. Shout out to Dr. Kevin Drow, University of Northern Iowa, music education faculty. I felt like it was important to include my teachers when you and I talked. Okay, I just, I had that yearning to include them, so that's why they're here. Then I moved on to junior high, Heath Junior High with Mr. Kirk Vogel. He's a prolific composer as well. Retired now, but you've probably seen his name on scripts and and scores and pieces. High school, I went to Greeley Central High School, Mr. Jeff Davis. I was big into tennis and trombone at that time. Started studying with my trombone teacher, Dr. Nat Wickham, at the University of Northern Colorado. And then I got to the end of high school and had to choose, like we all do. Had to choose the different interests, the different passions. And it came down to me between psychology and music education. And so I decided to go with music ed. All right, so then get into University in Northern Colorado, where I'd already been studying with a teacher for a while. Decided to major in music education. Had a wonderful time at that university. I'd call out all my teachers there, but there are too many to, to name right now. Um, but I will name one, and that's my dad. He was one of my teachers, Dr. Richard Main at University of Northern Colorado. And one thing I would like to say, and I like to say this at the beginning of these presentations is, I've been a professional trombone player since I was the age of 18. And I still consider my one, myself one today, even though I'm doing something slightly different for a living. Um, that's never, never tapered off for me, okay? And so that's kind of my background a little bit in school. Got through my music ed degree, went out, got my first job, taught middle school band, loved every second of it. Loved teaching middle school kids, okay? Moved on to a high school position, not because I didn't enjoy middle school, but because I just had a good opportunity in a different town, a little closer to family. Love teaching high school band. And then I had an opportunity to go back to grad school. And I asked myself, you know, I'm feeling some yearnings here. And I use that word on purpose. And we can come back to that later. Feeling some yearnings here. Do I want to pursue graduate school in music? Or do I want to pursue it in something different? And if it was different, what's making me choose that choice? Okay, I'm paying attention to those yearnings that I'm having. 
So I decided to go take a right turn like you'd mentioned earlier and explore that psych psychology field a little bit. Went into clinical mental health counseling, came out of that degree, shout out to my supervisor, Dr. Mark Bolden, went to university, actually it was Trinity Washington University in Washington, DC. And fast forward a couple of years, had my own private practice, worked in schools, and just really enjoying my life right now. So it's a lot of me talking, but that's the, the quick and, and short version of it for you. Gary, I love it. And you know, first of all, every single name that you gave during that introduction, you've just made their life. And we know that teachers don't do it for the money. They do it because of the effect. They do it because of the relationships that we build. So those teachers are just sitting there and they're smiling and the amount of pride, you know, just it exudes. Can we get back to that idea of yearning? Because I think that there was a lot of just wonderful things that you mentioned, but I felt a lot of autonomy. I felt that throughout every single chapter of your life, there was an ability for you to drive your own ship. And I think sometimes our students don't feel that, that if they want to pursue that yearning or that dream, that that's not set up for them. So can you talk a little bit more about that word and some insight maybe into what that looks like in your life and your dream for all of our students? Yeah, absolutely. You know, just to fast forward for our audience a little bit, I'd really like to hit on what we're going to talk about now with yearnings. But yearnings can be directly connected to strengths. And then later on in this conversation, we're going to talk about trauma. Okay, so that's a little bit of a glimpse into the future here. But a yearning, at least in the way I like to think of it, can kind of give us an insight into what our natural talents are. Okay, what do we feel ourselves yearning for or naturally pulled towards? That can give us a little bit of an insight into, into our talents. And I just mentioned strengths. Here's what a strength is a strength is something you can grow, a talent is something that's naturally part of you. And so how do you turn a talent into a strength? I'll give you that formula and I'll tell you the book I, I use when I reference that too, okay? So a talent is something natural. That means that something comes easily to you naturally, that you experience success with it relatively naturally as well, that you yearn to improve at it. And then quite often, with practice, you experience glimpses of excellence. That's what, what a, a talent is. And so turning it into a strength, you identify what your talents are, and then you add learned knowledge and acquired skills. That's the formula for growing strengths. And as teachers, here's how that can become very useful. We talk about how we give feedback to students. And if there's one thing that I could uh, feel good about each student in my program leaving with at the end of their time, it's knowing what their natural born talents are and what they're trying to grow them into strengths to be. Maybe that's not music. Maybe one of my best trumpet players is also really naturally gifted in science. Shoot, there's nothing wrong with, with encouraging that, man, you're, you're rocking your science classes. That's gotta feel really good, congrats. What that does is that gives them feedback on what their natural talents may be. And if they choose to gain the skill set and the learned knowledge, my goodness, that, that can turn into a strength for them really quickly, okay? One thing that I also know you wanna talk about today because we, we referenced it a little bit before this call was, the idea of a, a therapeutic alliance. And am I jumping too far ahead here? Or is that okay if we move into that? Go ahead. You know, you know, I, th there's some things that I want to unpack a little bit before we get there, though, because yeah, I, you know, I, I think that oftentimes when we get locked into the teacher-student relationship, um, the teacher kind of jumps the jumps ahead too many steps and says, "These are your strengths, and these are." the areas that you need to work on. It's called grading, right? And we know that from how you just framed that, Gary, 
that it needs to be much more of a dialogue, much more of a relationship where the students are able to self-assess, where the students are able to mm-hmm. say, you know, here's where I see myself, accurate self-perception, things like that. And so spot on, my friend, when you say that science might be this student's thing, you know, when we look at our band classrooms, or our music classrooms, we look at them and, you know, the cream rises and the students who get the most attention are the ones who want music more than anything. But the students who sometimes get the most out of our class are the ones who music will give more to them than they will ever give back to music. And that's OK. Definitely. And we can let's let's uh, bookmark that when we come back to the trauma piece later, because that can be a really powerful thing that they, that we provide for students. Um, one thing I was thinking of when you mentioned that a question I think can be very useful for young students any of any age really but especially young ones is hey what are you finding interesting in school right now okay and then also what do you think you're just naturally pretty good at those two questions can be super powerful because they can start to help students uncover something that could turn into a polished diamond later but right now it's a little bit it's a little bit rough right so what do you find interesting in school right now? And what do you feel you're pretty naturally good at? Those two questions, if they can answer that, they're on the right track. So Gary, let, let me push that just a little bit. So I'm thinking in the class, because I agree with you 110%, but you say, you know, what are you interested in, in school right now? And the kid says, nothing, absolutely mm-hmm. nothing. Where do we go from there? Because we know, uh, you know, we're, we're hinting at it, we're talking about it, and we're going to hit trauma soon because we know that a lot of students right now are just shutting down. <clears throat> they're just mm-hmm. hitting that wall and they're saying, nothing's interesting to me. I'm becoming numb. And we know that that is just such a challenge for our students these days. So when the student says, nothing interests me, how do we go that next step further to unpack this a little bit? My mind goes to a number of different places there. I like to I like to operate from a point of strength and a point of of pride. So I say, you know what? What are you proud of right now? They might say nothing. So you have to get dig a little bit deeper, right? And then when we find a little bit of something, maybe it's about providing some of that in the moment feedback, you know? I say, I see in your, your grade report here that your grades actually looking pretty good in, in your English class. What, what do you make of that? And so just trying to find those little ends that we can find in, in maybe that student who appears to be shut down. How can we find those little moments? Maybe acknowledge some of the reasons they could be feeling down, of course. But then when they let us in a little bit after that acknowledgement, that validation of how they're feeling. Look for those bright moments where we can get in and help them remember some of those talents that they have and dust off some of those strengths is how I like to say it. Dust off the strengths. I love it. Uh, and, and help. Sometimes they just need encouragement. You know, I, I think of the movie Soul, the new movie that came out, and uh, there's Joe's working with a young trombone person who's improvising, and just dust off the strength. I, I love that. I'm going to use that. I'm going to steal it. I hope you don't mind. So when we talk about this, I think a lot of our listeners right now are thinking, okay, so what can a mental health professional help? me do in the classroom and i actually Mm -hmm. want to reverse that question because i think to help frame that i think i want to ask you how does your role as a musician impact your job as a counselor you know that's a really great question my mind goes a million places here too my i've been really really fortunate in my musical life to had the opportunity to not only in my teaching life, which is a given, but in my performing life to perform with people all over the world, playing all sorts of different kinds of music. And what that has really allowed me to do, I think the most is 
just learn how to be in situations and learn from other people, whether that's in musically or at a set break or something like that. And you're just trying to come up with conversation with people you don't know very well, trying to find how to relate to each other. Um, that's one thing that comes to mind right off the top. But I can also tell you this from my teaching life. When I was a young teacher, pretty quickly I found I had a natural talent at connecting with students where they'd wanna come and tell me things about their lives. And that's one of the most special things about being, for me, about being a teacher when I was uh, a full-time teacher is getting to know students on a level that I'm not sure I have access to, sometimes even as a counselor, to be honest with you, because the kids really enjoyed band class. They enjoyed the rehearsals, they enjoyed the performances. We had that connection, we had that relationship. And so naturally, that would create the avenue for them to come to me with things. Sometimes it was something hilarious, I don't know, you know? Other times it was something they were really proud of outside of school. Other times it was reporting that they were worried about the health of their friend. And going back to the idea of yearnings, after a number of years of being a happy, proud teacher and band director, the yearnings within myself became so strong to want to be the person that I was referring kids out to when they were coming to me with things like that. And that's a really powerful experience for me. And I'm talking about myself today. I can remember one time um, I was an adult on the Colorado Ambassadors of Music trip as a, a chaperone conductor, things like that. And we, on the last day of the trip, there was a student who was killed at home. And so a lot of kids overseas in Europe knew this kid and were friends. And in that very moment right there, the yearning inside myself was so strong to want to be the person that had um, the skill set to, to really support folks in those moments. I had to by default because we were overseas. And luckily, I had a lot of great colleagues that helped as well. But the, the yearning became so strong to want to be the person I referred kids out to that that's how I made my choice when I went back to grad school of kind of what I wanted to do, you know? And just to kind of give you a window into that experience a little bit, I always like to refresh this part of the conversation where I was still pushing it hard musically. It's not like I let the pedal off and made a, a shift. Okay, music's very important to me and it always will be. It's not going one direction. There, there was no fork. What it was was parallel lines. Okay, so just to make that pretty clear too. Gary, so I, I think right now our, our listeners are just thinking, yeah, right there, what he just said. So in that moment, when we have the, the tragedy, when we have that mm -hmm. moment and, it, you know, tragedy is subjective, you know, it could be the loss of a friend, it could be a breakup, it could be something that's happening at home. And hindsight's twenty twenty in terms of what the effect of that really is going to be in perspective. Yeah. But in that moment, how would you advise our teachers navigate that line between empathetic listener, social and emotional learning facilitator, music educator, and that line blurs really quickly into your world? How would you suggest we navigate that? You know, first of all, I, I think that it's a, it's a, it's a reason to celebrate having to ask ourselves that question because it means we have kids confiding in us with things that are, are important to them. So that's, a, that's time to celebrate. Congratulations, everyone. If you can relate to that, that's fantastic. Kids wanna tell you stuff, my goodness. That's so cool, okay? And what I think is really important to know is what our role is in a school. What is, what is my scope of practice? I still think about that for myself now, okay? And my role in a school as a counselor is to support anything self-harm related, any mandated reporting sorts of, of items. Teachers are mandated report reporters too, of course, but any sort of self-harm, suicidal ideation, 
what I really encourage folks to do in the teaching role is to be there to listen with the student. Be really clear about validating the feelings that you're hearing from the student. Be really clear about saying, you know, I appreciate you sharing this information with me and we're only gonna tell the people who need to know about this. Okay, your safety is really important. We're only gonna tell the people that we need to know. And then it's all about that warm handoff to the school counselor if we're talking about a, a school here. All right. But to go back to the idea of therapeutic alliance, one thing I find in my role now, the most important thing as a therapist is the quality of the relationship of, I, that I have with the person I'm working with. That's what the therapeutic alliance is. It's me as, as provider and the person I'm with becoming allied on what they're working towards. And I was experiencing all sorts of alliances as a teacher too. That's one of the, the things that I miss the most about teaching music is having that with so many kids. My role now, I feel like I have the same quality of relationship, but it's with a, it's a, with a smaller number of kids. It's just a different role, okay? So I think in short, knowing what my role is in a school, knowing what is within my scope and knowing what I'm gonna to have to provide that warm handoff to, to somebody else with, okay? The warm handoff, I love that. I, that that is just such a powerful way because we know, um, and, and no offense to any of the counselors who are listening, that the relationship that we have with our music teacher, because we see them year after year after year, mm -hmm. we see them before school, we see them after school, we see them in Europe when we take them mm -hmm. on trips that yeah. that's what is that developmental relationship. That's where we have that trust. That's where we have that confidant that I feel safe coming to you that traditionally we don't have with the school counselors. So I think that warm handoff is the critical piece that so many teachers need to hear that, whoa, this isn't all on me. This is something that I'm gonna be that empathetic listener. I'm gonna validate the feelings as you just so beautifully said, and then this is, kind, I'm always going to be here to listen, but this is kind of as far as I can take you right now, that warm yeah. handoff to the folks who know what to do. Here's another piece of info that I could find helpful or that I found helpful too myself, especially having gone through training programs, going through my education degree, going through graduate school. What I found is Let's go back to the fundamental idea of strengths again here. Empathy has always been pretty natural for me. That's one of my talents. And so I've really tried to grow that into a strength in the field that I've chosen by gaining information in school and developing the skill set. That's that's the that's the equation for growing a strength. Okay? So through that, and this might be a good segue into trauma, through that we are also training ourselves, our physical self. When I find myself in a situation where things are starting to just feel too heavy for me, quite often there's a reason for that. And that's because I need to include someone else whose role it is to address whatever the, the weight is. So let me give you an example of that, a very solid example. Um, and these are real things. We, we hear these in schools every day. So maybe a student comes into us and says, hey, Mr. Main, I just have to let you know, I, I saw on Instagram yesterday, a friend of mine, I don't know what to do, but they, they posted that they want to kill themselves. Okay. That can become very heavy, very quickly. And because of my training, I've been training myself. Maybe that's a cue that, hey, I'm gonna be here for this kid. I'm gonna listen to him. I'm gonna make sure that they feel validated. And then we're just gonna go tell the people we need to know about this for the warm handoff. And as soon as that warm handoff is made, that weight will start to come away. And I think about that with myself now too. If I'm trying to practice within the scope of, of what I'm trained to do and something starts to become too heavy, right? 
well, maybe I need to do a little research on that. Or so you see what I'm saying is we're as we're developing our strengths, we're also training ourselves. And so when we say listen to our gut, as long as that gut's well trained, I'd say listen to it. But when we get into trauma, sometimes that gut's not well trained. And we can talk about that too. Yeah, Gary, I, I would definitely go into trauma because th this is just it's the reality of where we're living right now. But I want to address something that I think teachers are and, and you just hit at it in your own life, but empathy fatigue, you know, teachers mm -hmm. are just putting the weight of all of the challenges on their shoulders. And we just see teachers just done right now burned mm -hmm. out. How am I even going to want to come back in the fall? because yeah. of everything that has happened. Uh, advice, thoughts, insight for our teachers who are at that point themselves, because you use the word just too heavy. Well, this entire school year has just been too heavy. How do oh we recover goodness. from yeah. that? Well, if I had the answer to that, uh, no, I'm just kidding. I do have some ideas. It's not gonna be an answer. Um, the word that I like to use is, is manage. How do we manage things? How do we create a situation for ourselves that feels manageable? How do we develop resources, internal resources that we can take with us anywhere that help things stay manageable? How do we remind ourselves what our external resources are, things we can go to? And then also the idea, uh, and we can unpack each one of those. I like to combine the idea of boundaries and self-care to give us the best shot possible for good mental health, okay? And there's a reason why I start with boundaries. If I can talk about self-care all day long, and I do, <laughs> okay. But if we start there, maybe we're having to think too much about how much we're having to care for ourselves to begin with. Let's start with boundaries. Let me use some solid examples, okay? So when I was teaching public school, specifically high school, but middle school too, in, re in retrospect, there were weeks throughout the year where I was getting to school at 7 a.m. and leaving at 8.30 p.m., nine at night. We know how that is, especially during, during the play or marching band season or whatever the season is. I mean, some, some high schools that I know, that's, uh, and I don't want to just say high schools because I'm in middle schools too, but that's my experience. Some high schools that I know, shoot, that's a year round thing. Okay. So how do we put boundaries in place for ourselves So we have an accurate take of what we need when we talk about self-care. Okay. That's the first one I like to do is boundaries. And that can be a very individual pursuit, but just naming it as a, as a pursuit at all is step one. Okay, step one is admitting we have a problem, right? So let's talk about self-care now. I could talk about for three hours on boundaries. So let's just call it out. People can, can become, um, they can take this on as a goal for themselves, right? Self-care, here's how I like to think of it. I like to think about self-care in the same way I like to think about eating. I really, really like uh, playing tennis. That's one of my things. And I usually go out for a couple hours. Okay. But I can't do that all the time. It takes two hours. And so tennis for me is like a meal. And I don't always need a meal during the day. Sometimes I just need a snack. And so it's important to think about self-care in those terms. What are our meals? Is it a conversation with our family? Is it going out and playing tennis? Is it getting a good night's sleep? Those could all be meals because they take some time. But sometimes I need some sustenance in between meals. I need to have some self-care snacks. And for me, an example of that's like a couple things on YouTube that I find hilarious. I start to laugh, I get the endorphins going, boost my mood. It literally makes me feel better. And so I can find a video that takes 30 seconds. Or I can find a video, you know, that's an example of a snack. So for self-care, what are my meals that take some time? What are my snacks? So that when I need something, it's there and I know what it, what it is and it, it, it uh, does the trick. Okay, so that's a good way to think of it. Boundaries, 
self-care meals and snacks. Um, what else on that? So, you know, as you're talking about that, I'm thinking, how, how good are my boundaries? You know, where, where are those right now? And ask my wife, they're probably not as, as firm as they, they probably should be. And uh, to me, this is all very telling that if we're going to engage our students in these discussions, that we need to have the courage and the vulnerability to play the game ourselves, that we need to ask ourselves, where are we in our own boundary setting and what are our own snacks and what are our own meals and what meals do we enjoy? Um, I, I love the analogies there and I love how strong that is. Can we go ahead and go exactly where I think we've wanted to go for the, for the duration of this and, and thinking about this idea of trauma? Because... Mm -hmm. Um, teachers have been traumatized, students mm -hmm. have been traumatized, and I, my hypothesis is that this fall trauma is going to be more of a baseline than an anomaly. And I think trauma has always been part of our, our system, our educational system, but I, I, I just see it ramping up. Uh, yeah. so can you help us, you know, we talk about buzzwords, SEL certainly is one of them. But mm -hmm. trauma-informed certainly is right up there. So when we talk about trauma, what does that mean to you? And, and how can we engage with students who have been traumatized? You know, I'm hearing a, a couple of different avenues there. Let's start with, with trauma itself, okay? And what I'm gonna do, I'm a very cognitively based therapist. And so I'm gonna go through that really quickly. So in, in cognitive behavioral therapy, I'll go through the cycle with you here. And I'll, I like to use this. Um, something happens. We automatically have a thought about whatever happened. Often that thought can influence how we feel or our emotions. And quite often those emotions can influence how we choose or our behavior. So just going through that again, something happens. Some folks may call that a trigger. We have an automatic thought about the trigger. It's just how we're built. That automatic thought can quite often influence how we feel, which can impact how we choose or our behavior. And that can happen real quick, okay? And some folks may ask, well, what? What are my triggers? And trauma, those triggers come from somewhere. And so that's how trauma can play a part. What are my triggers? Okay. Before I get into that part, here's it can work both ways. Okay. So I see an Oreo cookie. Oh my gosh, it looks delicious. I'm getting really excited. I pick that Oreo cookie up and enjoy it. That's CBT too. That's the cycle. Okay. So it doesn't always have to be something that includes a negative emotion. That's just how we how we're built. All right. Could be our passion our with whole, music. Could be how much right. we Could love music, any. and that's what influences us wanting to work on, to practice, and the cycle of wanting to improve. One hundred percent. Whenever I see my trombone, it, I have the same feeling, and that's no joke. It just really improves my mood. Even looking at that thing, I don't know. Just how I'm built, I guess. Um, but our triggers are triggers for a reason. And sometimes, if the reasons aren't good, then we can talk about trauma. Okay. So trauma can be in a couple different categories. And just to call this out too, we all have a different relationship with that word to begin with. So even the first time trauma was mentioned in this podcast, that probably brought up some automatic thoughts for people. Just wanted to acknowledge that too. We all have a different relationship with that word. And trauma can fit into a couple different buckets. One can be what they call big T trauma. Big T trauma is something that was either potentially life-threatening or maybe a, a, a diagnosis that was given that could have been life-threatening or, or was, or observing somebody going through something life-threatening. That's really what we call the big T trauma piece, okay? Small T trauma can be just about anything. That's what makes it so complex sometimes and so complicated. Here is the common theme between the two of them. What makes something traumatic? What makes the same experience for one person not, in pers not impact another person similarly, even if it's exactly the same? Well, trauma kind of operates off the notion 
that something about that experience has become stuck in the brain where it has not been fully processed through. And what that can include is physical sensations, the cognition we were having about ourself at the time and fill in the blank. But those are a couple common ones. For example, I always use this example, so I'll use it today too. If, if I was bullied in middle school, and this is repeatedly, okay, or, or even once, depending on the person, but if I was bullied in middle school, maybe I was made to feel powerless in middle school, right? And that could have been some, it maybe not have been life-threatening, but something about that has become stuck because even years down the road, something will happen that takes me back to that same feeling I had in middle school of being powerless or having no control in situations. Maybe it's a boss who approaches me aggressively uh, with their words, right? But maybe that could be triggering for me back to that moment in middle school. And here's how I like to think about that. Sometimes those stuck feelings over time can become more complex because we have different experiences that make us feel the same way. And what can happen for folks is if they're all connected by a similar feeling, in the present day, when we light up that feeling, it can light up all of them like an electrical circuit. Isn't that interesting? And so that's why those feelings can become so big so quickly, even by something that to an outside person looks relatively small. Okay. And so in the work that I do now, that's part of, part of my work with people who want to make progress on something like that in their lives. Let's identify your triggers. Okay. Let's give you some tools, some resources to work through those when you're feeling triggered. But then let's do some work on what made those things a trigger to begin with. And that's where a lot of that digging can come in. And there are a couple approaches I use to that. One of them, of course, is traditional CBT, but another one's called EMDR. Um, I won't go into the weeds here, but I just thought I'd, I'd make sure I mentioned that. Can you let uh, us know what that, what, who, what that stands for? Yeah. It stands for eye movement, desensitization, and reprocessing. And it, like I said, it, it operates on the, the idea that something about those experiences did not fully process through the brain and they're now stuck, whether it's the feeling or the negative cognition, like I'm powerless or both. And so what we do is we would identify those moments as targets and through what, there, there are a lot of steps here, but I'm going right to the reason why it's unique. Um, once we identify the targets through a method of reprocessing that experience, using eye movement while I'm asking someone to focus on uh, the target itself, um, it allows the brain to fully process through those events. So it's not like we forget about them, it's not hypnosis, but it allows the stuck part to process fully through. That's the, the, the cool thing. And then hopefully it makes those triggers less triggering. So quick question on this, you know, we, we didn't unpack this beforehand. So so we're, uh, we're, we're punting here and having some fun. So when we're reading music, and our eyes are naturally scanning and moving, does that release the ability of our brain to process things more fully when we're doing that? That's a great question. I, I think a lot of it depends on how we're feeling in the room before we start doing it. And this is where we can spend a lot of time talking to I always like to make sure that when I respond, I'm using, for the most part, some pretty researched responses, especially when it comes to trauma. So I'm not sure I'm gonna be able to give you a specific response to that. Would I be surprised by it? No, not at all. I just don't wanna make stuff up today, okay? Here's what I will say though. Thinking back to Therapeutic Alliance, I remember students that only felt comfortable in the band room as their one safe place in the school and the coolest thing about what we do for a living is we ask kids to sit in a room and feel. How cool is that? We ask kids to, you know, maybe just consider 
what it might be like to use more front on those articulations. Here's where language can get important in our rehearsals. And this is another interesting thing. When that vibe is there, kids are gonna want to do what they can for, for us. When that therapeutic alliance is there, okay? How we voice things can be really, really important for kids, especially kids who have an, a high ACEs score. If we, if we wanna refer to that adverse childhood experiences score, we can look that up more on our own. If they found a place of comfort in the band room, they're gonna be more willing to choose to do things that may be out of their comfort zone. And for some kids, that just means feeling certain things, okay? So how we phrase things can be important. I'm gonna go into my actor mode here, okay? Um, trumpets, I need you to pay attention, okay? Could be very true, <laughs> okay? But how we phrase that to students is important, okay? How we present ourselves, how we invite people to participate, to make choices for themselves, that's trauma-based. We're providing kids the opportunity to choose. Now, if there's, an, if there's an outlying student who's continually not making that choice, of course, we're gonna have a, a, a conversation with them um, at a different time because we don't wanna impact the, the whole with trumpets, you need to pay attention. Sorry to use that aggressive language. It felt aggressive to me when I said it, okay? But if we're thinking trauma-informed here, that can, that can really hurt therapeutic alliances. And, uh, you know, trumpets, I just, I just wanna maybe ask you to try using a little more front on those notes. Saying things, that gives people a choice. I'm not doing it for you. I'm doing it because I care about being in the choir room, the band room, the orchestra hall so much that I'm gonna make that choice today. I'm gonna to try and use more front. Shoot, that's empowering. Thanks right. for using that last word, empowering, because I think that's a major part of where we're seeing SEL in our world right now, and that is student empowerment, agency, having students being in control, but also having them have the space to affect meaningful change in their classroom and their schools and communities. So it, it, you, you've given us just some absolutely brilliant uh, equations to, to think about and uh, not as firm as math, but in, in your mind, what are a couple of paths that we can go through in that therapeutic alliance or, or in, in however we're looking for this trusting relationship to truly get at that piece of student empowerment? Yeah, great question. Um, you know, in general, trauma-informed delivery is all about cultivating a sense of safety, groundedness, resilience, and just being present in the moment with ourselves and with our emotions. That's really the goal. It's all, and then it's all about self-regulation when things get a little bit off center, okay? This is a real opportunity for us. So what I'm encouraging us to consider is that all of our cues, whether it's visual, whether it's verbal feedback, how can we phrase the same message in a way that feels inviting for students to choose? And I think it's very possible to do that, okay? I'm gonna give so, folks a little bit of a, of a hint here. One way that I've found this is, I went to a trauma-based yoga training one time I am not flexible, okay? I'll just put that out there for the world to hear. But here's what I found interesting about it. It was a full three solid days of training, okay? The first time I did any sort of yoga was towards the end of the second day. Can you believe that? It was a trauma-informed yoga training and we didn't move until towards the end of the second day because a lot of the training was about our vocal delivery. It was about how do we, a lot of the folks I was there with were much more versed with yoga than me. So they were there for the trauma-informed piece and I was there for the polar opposite reason, 
Okay, I've got the trauma information and I wanted to get, hey, how can I use movement as part of this? And a lot of the emphasis was on how we phrase things. You know, trumpets, you need to play with more front. Why am I picking on the trumpets? That's no fair. Trombones, you need to play with more front. Okay, that's not real inviting. You know, trombones, maybe just try seeing how much front you can use on the note this time. Maybe just try is an invitation to choose. Trombones, I need you to use more front. I don't know. You see, this is where a lot of this kind of experimentation can happen. But that's something that came to mind. How can we develop a culture of empowering students to want to choose versus uh, more of a, a power and control dynamic? And then if there are outliers who really struggle to, to stay involved and, and want to choose, maybe that's an individual conversation. Maybe strengthening the relationship with that one student will encourage them in rehearsal to want to choose. And shoot, that takes time. But um, that's part of the fun. And, and time is a gift that we actually have in music ed traditionally. You know, when, when I was uh, a K-12 teacher, fifth grade through 12th grade, I had them eight years. You know, yeah. there was going to be a relationship built during those eight years. I just hoped it was going to be a positive one. Heck yeah. And, and that's, that's a gift. Absolutely. So, Gary, as we're starting to wind up our time today, uh, you've given us so many things to think about and so many things that really call us to be purposeful, really call us to think about our words, think about how we are inviting students to be part of our classroom and leading with empathy and grace that whether it be big T or small T trauma, that it's a reality and that, you know, whether we're looking at them and be like, oh, that's not that big of a deal, just get over it. Well, for them, it is a big deal. And they're well, not think able about to... The elect... yeah. Sorry to interrupt you, Scott. Oh, no, well, Think please. about the electrical circuit. We see who's in front of us right now. And if we feel like, back to the idea of triggers, if we feel like, you know, that trigger seemed pretty small for them to have this kind of a response, most likely their electrical circuit lit up all sorts of stuff we don't know about. And they became extremely emotionally flooded. So just to, I mean, that's a way to, to way, a way to look at it that's also very trauma informed emotionally flooded oh my goodness i'm taking that 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 that, that clarifies so much that when the reaction doesn't in in our brains from our perspective match what the the stimulus was that there's so many more lights that are lighting up that that that's mm -hmm. the space that you know it's the iceberg we see the tip and everything else is underneath mm -hmm. Gary, you've given us so many gifts today, but is there anything else that you want to share with our music teachers, our music students to better understand how we can tackle this fall uh, with the proper headspace? Oh, man. You know, maybe one thing I, I think social, I'd like to say two things. I think social emotional learning has been a thing for a very long time. Even if we're just putting language to it now, I can think of teachers that I've gotten to know over the years who were doing exactly what we've been talking about for, for their whole career. I also think that there's a lot of power in putting language to practice so that we can, we can uh, spread the good word, right? But I wanted to make sure I said that because I can think of so many teachers who were doing just that, that I've had personally. And the second thing, there, there are two recordings that I wanna encourage everyone to go out and listen to that I think really demonstrates what we've been talking about today, how this is a lifelong pursuit, social emotional learning. Um, if there's one thing, I'll come back to that later actually, Scott, okay? You asked me that on the paperwork earlier, and I want to make sure I answer that question. But the two recordings I want you to, to go out and listen to, the first one is Glenn Gould, 1955, Goldberg Variations Aria. It's track one on that CD. The second recording is Glenn Gould, 
1981, Goldberg Variations Aria. I think it's track one on that CD. That's social emotional learning. Same guy playing the same thing. The only difference is the amount of time in between the recordings and uh, life experience. I'd encourage you just to take a listen to those two recordings and just see what you think about that, okay? And the last question I wanna answer here, what life skills, this is, I'm reading off our sheet, what life skills do you hope our K-12 students learn through music education? Okay, here's my answer. How to enter the DMV, see a very, very long line and leave with a new driver's license. Even if they're hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. Because we can all relate to that. That's a frustrating experience, or at least it can be. And if we can come out the other side, leaving with what we need, shoot, that's everything, right? Gary, one, I know what I'm going to do when we hang up today, is I'm going to go listen to those two recordings. And I think that we're still wrapping our heads around what this looks like in the music world. And I think that's a perfect example. And I, I think the universal feeling of frustration is when you pull up to in, in Illinois here, we call it the secretary of state, but you're, you're getting out of your car and you're like, Oh, I'm 20 minutes early before they even open and you're 75th in line. And That's right. I sure hope that we have the skills to get through there and end up with that document on the other side. Mm -hmm. 100%. No, I appreciate it, Scott. Thanks for having me on. Um, I'll send you some links. If, if folks want to connect with me, they're more than welcome to. Um, I love talking with people about stuff. Gary, a gift to the profession, a gift to this series. Thank you so very much. Uh, and just so everybody uh, can hear this, this the type of person who Gary is, he closed on a home today and he's still talking with us. The gifts of flexibility, the gifts of patience, and the gift of generosity. Gary, thank you so much. Please be safe, be well, and until our paths cross again, take care. You too. Thanks, Thanks. Scott. Bye-bye. Music for All's mission is to create, provide, and expand positively life-changing experiences through Music for All. Our vision is to be a catalyst to ensure that every child across America has access and opportunity to participate in active music making in their scholastic environment. I want to thank Gary Main for helping us understand each other's worlds, understanding how he is embodying all of these, but we're bringing one perspective and to be empathetic to lead with grace, to understand big T, small t trauma, and to understand that there are things we can do in our classroom to help our students through these challenges. I'd like to thank our national presenting sponsor, the Yamaha Corporation of America. Be sure to check out the Yamaha Educator Suite at yamahaeducatorsuite.com. And I'd like to thank GIA Publications for their continued support. Before we say goodbye, we are extremely grateful for any donations gifted to our nonprofit organization. If you enjoyed this program, and in order for us to continue to provide free educational resources and advocacy materials, please consider gifting to Music for All in any amount. Please visit musicforall.org backslash give. For Music for All, I'm Scott Edgar. Thank you.